Well, happy holidays to everyone. Uh, hope everyone is uh, happy and safe this holiday season. Uh, I'm Scott Stevenson. I'm a brand ambassador from Daniel Smith, and I just wanted to uh, welcome you all today. Uh, I wanted to uh, take a moment and, and um, uh, thank uh, Tennessee Watercolor Society. Wendy, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you again. And, um, and none of this is possible without um, Plaza Artist Materials. I just wanna thank uh, Eric and, and Lauren um, for uh, helping me coordinate uh, this event today. And I just wanted to um, um, just extend a, a very hearty welcome from, from the owners of Daniel Smith, uh, John Cogley and, and Catherine Taylor, who, who you, I think some of you have had the pleasure of meeting in the past. And, it's uh, just a uh, interesting time uh, these days, and and uh, I'm just happy that we we have this medium of, of meeting through Zoom to be able to talk about our love of watercolor. And uh, just a few uh, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we are uh, going to take questions through chat, so please feel free if if you have questions to put them into the chat. And my good friend Lauren. Uh, we'll be uh, looking for those and she will uh, shout them out to me as, as you guys have questions. Um, this is, you know, even though that we're doing it over, over, uh, over Zoom, I still want this to be an opportunity for, for everybody to ask questions. And uh, so if you have questions, like I said, just go ahead and, and put them into the chat and, and we'll be um, looking for those. I, I really do like the interaction with you all. Uh, we always have a good time together, so um, feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like. And if we get too far off the rails, then um, I'll go ahead and um, go ahead and kind of bring us back to center. So, what we're going to do um, is that we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Daniel Smith and and the uh, story behind it, and how our uh, how we came to be, and and our uh, philosophy, and how we make our paint. Uh, we'll talk also about some other fun subjects like quinacridone and light fastness and granulation. And we'll talk about all of those things. Uh, my goal here today is, is to have you all uh, uh, know more and more and hopefully more and more appreciation of, of Daniel Smith as, as a manufacturer. And, um, and hopefully some wonderful ideas on how to uh, augment what you all already do. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, go to my screen share here where we're gonna kind of get started. And we're gonna look at this here. And uh, we're gonna talk about where we all, where Daniel Smith got his start. So Daniel Smith is a real guy. We didn't make, we didn't uh, make him up. It's not his Hollywood name. He, uh, He's a, a real guy who got his uh, start in art at the University of Washington in 1976, where he was working um, at the school printing press where they made the school newspaper. And one day they were standing around the printing press and they were lamenting about how great it would be if they could get, her, get a better printmaking ink uh, for the press. And uh, they all, uh, everybody just was, was wondering, well, what if somebody could make a better ink? You know, could somebody make a better ink? So they went around the room and, and asked, you know, started asking around, well, hey, how about you? Why don't you give it a shot? And so it went all, the, all around the room and, and it finally got to Dan here. And Dan said, well, sure, you know, I'll give it a shot. So he did a lot of research. He found the best oil-based uh, binder he could find and, and the best black pigment. And he brought that together back to his parents' basement in Seattle and put the batch together, mixed it as well as he could, and then brought it back to the school where they gave it a shot at the school printing press. And lo and behold, it was much better than, than what they were using. So it didn't take long for the art department at the University of Washington uh, to hear about this wonderful ink. And um, they decided that they would like it for themselves. So, um, so basically they went back to Dan and said, hey, Dan, um, could you make this in colors? So they gave him some, gave him a, uh, gave him some uh, cash to be able to go and buy the product and he sourced it. 
and then brought it back to his uh, uh, manufacturing facility or his, his parents' basement, as it was. And they developed uh, the first, uh, first big batches of uh, Daniel Smith printmaking. Uh, so that's kind of how Dan got, got his start. Uh, how I got my start uh, was I was a uh, firefighter with the US Forest Service. Uh, I had done that for about eight years. And then my son got to the place where he was wanting to go camping. And he said, hey, dad, you know, when are we going to go camping? And I said, well, you know, son, why don't we wait till the summer, you know, when the weather is better and, you know, it'll be warm and things like that. And, and he said, but, you know, dad, if, if we wait that long, then it'll be fire season again and you won't be able to go. So after a after a couple of years of that, it kind of wore on me, and, and I decided at that point that um, it was more important for me to be a, to be a dad who took his uh, took his son camping uh, rather than uh, continue this job as a firefighter. So it was one of the best choices ever because what ended up happening is I ended up uh, getting to work for uh, my mom, who was the founder of my company, and uh, and she brought me on uh, then shortly after. So. Here we are, 1976, and, and Dan has uh, uh, made his first batches of ink for the art department, and it was such a hit that he ended up having to quit his job at the school printing press in order to keep up with the orders from the art department. Um, very cool picture here. So uh, there is Dan Smith actually uh, sitting um, there in front of you, and um, there he is with his uh, two buddies who were his uh, first couple of employees. So, um, so what ended up happening was that Dan at that point uh, decided that he wanted to make more than just printmaking ink and he wanted to uh, uh, be a manufacturer of many different things. So the, the next product that he ended up making was the Daniel Smith Original Oil, which is uh, still around today. Um, it's not as popular as our watercolor, but it's, uh, it's still very popular among the, among, among the fans that it has. And, but, but it wasn't until 1993 uh, when he decided that he wanted to make watercolor. And the issue that he had was he, he really didn't have any idea um, what it should look like, what it should perform like. So what he ended up doing is he ended up attending a lot of the festivals around the world, like Fabriano in Italy and some of the others in, in China and, and the Philippines. So he took all of that information back uh, to Seattle, to his factory, and pulled, the, pulled all of the information together and brought the paint back out the following year and then uh, allowed the same artist who gave him the input to try the paint. And, uh, and it was an instant hit with the artist that, that, uh, um, that gave him the information because these artists then started using it in their classes and, and, and a number of other things. And suddenly uh, there was so much success with, uh, with these initial colors, there were 18 of them, uh, that it allowed him in 1998 to add uh, to the color palette. And one of the things that, that is very interesting to know about Dan is that he was, uh, he was always very interested in history and how these ancient civilizations uh, uh, basically represented themselves or, or, or um, allowed themselves to be, to be expressive through color. So when he looked at, at a variety of, of different civilizations uh, to see how they express themselves with color. So uh, the Mayans, for existence, uh, example, they used a color called uh, Amaz Amazonite, which is this here. And Amazonite was very popular with, with the Mayans because they thought, number one, it was a beautiful color for paint, but it, but it also had healing qualities. So they would take Amazonite and they would rest this on their sick and they believed that the Amazonite would, would help heal the people um, uh, of their illness. So lots of different interesting uh, uh, examples of how um, minerals and, and things like that were used throughout history to create color. So Dan wanted to figure out a way uh, to bring all of these beautiful colors uh, so that artists of today could use them. So lots of other examples. We have turquoise, um, which was used by the Plains Indians. 
and they would grind uh, uh, turquoise up very finely and mix it with animal fat. And then that became their war paint. So uh, the Egyptians, the Egyptians were, all, were also um, master chemists and they long ago figured out how to manipulate heat in order to purify uh, minerals. So all of these wonderful, wonderful examples that Dan uh, found throughout history, and he wanted to make these colors available to artists today. So he needed to figure out what the process was because initially his, his first idea was, well, let's just grind it up very fine and let's, um, let's turn it into paint. Well, it didn't end up working out very well for him that way because what ended up happening is he lost which what was very interesting and different about the mineral, which was actually the chemical, or excuse me, the crystal structure of the mineral. So what ended up happening was uh, uh, um, some of these beautiful colors would end up being altered because of the paint making process. So he needed to figure out a different way of doing it. And eventually he did, and he called it Primatech. Uh, which is short for primitive technology. So uh, his plan was, is how do I take something that's very, very large, even boulder size, and then make it small enough so that it's practical to use and paint, but not lose what's interesting and different about the mineral. So uh, this is a flow chart here of kind of how we do it. Um, in the next couple of pages here, you will see uh, some more examples of of, or more specifics and how we do that. So it all starts with this gentleman here, his name's Bruce and Bruce has the job that I want when he retires. Um, this guy gets to go all over the world and, and work uh, with all of the mine owners to source all of our beautiful minerals. And he gets to go to places like Brazil and China and Australia, um, all over the place, all basically all four corners of the earth where, where we get to go ahead and, and source our minerals. This is the guy who um, actually is on the ground for us uh, buying the mineral. And, uh, and he does, th there's three things that, are, that he really has to look out for. Um, he has to uh, buy it in large enough quantities. So when we buy it, we buy it in 15 year increments. Uh, but the other two I'm going to allow you guys to get. So what else do we look for and why do we buy it in such large quantities? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Let's see, I'm going to look along with you. There we go. Well, consistency. Yes, Laura, thank you. Yes, consistency is, is the number one thing. So when... Um, when we go ahead and purchase that much mineral, uh, we want to make sure that, that it has good consistency throughout. And the only way to do that is, is to actually buy it in large enough quantities so that the color is consistent. And uh, Judy, you're also correct. Um, what happens when we go to Costco? We get, a better, we get a better price because we buy in bulk, right? Same thing here. So when we buy in that large quantity, it also helps us uh, with, the, uh, with the costs of the mineral. So, and if we buy it in large enough uh, increments, then we know that we'll have a stable cost for, for the foreseeable future. So once, uh, once Bruce finds the mineral uh, that he is looking for, or the boulder really he's looking for. He arranges for the transportation and he puts it on the truck. And from that point, the truck heads to the port of the country where it is coming from and ends up on a ship and it arrives in the port of Seattle, which is where our factory is today. Uh, um, not much has changed uh, really with our production in, in really the last 40 years. We're in the same building in downtown Seattle. And um, we still do all of, our, all of our work there, even the tubing. So um, this is a completely made in the USA product. So uh, once it's at our factory, um, we go ahead and we end up breaking it, it, breaking it up in pieces that are about the size of, a, basically the size of a watermelon. And what we do is uh, we take it to that first mill and that first mill is, is a jaw mill. 
And that jaw mill is a very interesting piece of equipment. There's only three of them in the entire world. So we have one, but what other industry do you think could use a jaw mill as the way that you see it there in the pictures? What other industry could use it? Let's see. How about the jewelry industry? Think about um, jewelry for a minute, and they have actually some of the same uh, some of the same um, issues that we have. That they want to be able to take something that's that's very large, and actually make it so that it is smaller, so that they could use it for the jewelry industry. So basically, um, the way that this mill works is that. It has jaws and the jaws uh, clamp down on the big piece of mineral and cause it to break into smaller pieces. So basically it's gonna break into pieces that are this small, about the size of a softball. So, and we'll get about mm, probably 10 to 12 pieces this size out of that, out of that watermelon size piece. And then the rest is um, pretty much what we can't use and then it kind of ends up being discarded. Yeah, I see my buddy Tall. Hey, Todd, how are you, man? Good to see you. All right. So once we're um, once we're kind of uh, done with that mill, we uh, we take it over to our uh, we take it over to our second mill, which is the hammer mill. And that hammer mill um, also very interesting. It has a clamp that goes over the mineral. And what they're able to do is that they're able to go ahead and move the mineral around in order to remove the uh, spots of the, um, the impurities on the mineral away, uh, away from the mineral and keep the product that they do want. So if you look at um, this piece of uh, lapis here, I'm gonna go ahead and get out of this so that you guys can, can see it a little bit better. You see the gray here? This is byproduct that we can't use. So we have to figure out a way to remove it. And what we do is that we use that hammer mill, which has a, a spinning blade and that spinning blade is able to eat away uh, the product that we don't want. So what we end up with at that point is usually pieces now that are about, that are about this size. So now it's about, really it's about the, about the size of your thumb. So we started off really large. We started off as that um, big boulder and then we broke off a piece and then um, put the watermelon size piece into the, into the um, jaw mill and that jaw mill put pressure on it and turned it into something this size. Now that, and then that hammer mill now makes it this size. So, the next mill is really where I think all of the, um, really where all the magic happens and it happens with at our ball mill. And uh, the ball mill is like what you see there. And basically what it is, it's a spinning cylinder. And inside of that cylinder, there are um, silica uh, ball bearings and those ball bearings um, crash against each of these small pieces of mineral and causing them to break down into something that is very, very, very small. Basically, it breaks it down into uh, a size that's about 40 microns. So to kind of put that in perspective, um, if you feel the thickness of your uh, sheet of paper there in your, in your handout, um, that is 100 microns. Uh, the thickness of your hair is 70 microns. So what is coming out of the bottom of that mill um, is, pick, is mineral that's about half the diameter of a human hair. So it's really, really tiny. So even though it's so small, we don't lose what's interesting and valuable about the mineral. So for instance here, we're to, uh, with, um, with bloodstone, you see all of the beautiful granulation. With kyanite, you still see the shimmer. So even though we reduced it down so small, we don't lose what's interesting and valuable about the mineral. So, and, and this was, um, I mean, this process uh, literally took, took Dan five or six years in order to perfect. It's very interesting. Anybody have any questions so far? All right, let's see. All right, 
Lapis is a, is a mineral associated with creativity and you keep, you keep some by your easel. Yes, um, lapis is a, is a very beautiful mineral. I actually have a, a, a very large piece that I keep by my desk and it's, it's, it is very inspiring. I agree. All right, uh, okay, so what happens next? Well, now that we have the, the mineral to the right size, we take it to our, really where we pull all of our ingredients together. And uh, we have these uh, large pots or the, what we call our mixing vessels and we have them in various sizes. And the smallest one you see down there, that one is three gallons. And the other ones are, are actually much larger and we kind of had to shrink them down um, just because they wouldn't fit into the picture. But the largest one you see in the back is actually 300 gallons. So we can, uh, so the small one there, the little three gallon one is generally the one that's in our lab where we, when, when we're working on creating colors, uh, we will use basically miniature versions of all of our equipment uh, uh, to make the initial batches because it's more cost efficient that way. But we have, um, uh, but we have these mixing vessels in, in various sizes, uh, depending upon um, which color it is. Some, some colors actually sell quicker than others. And uh, the ones that sell at a higher rate of speed, um, we usually make bigger batches of that at a time. So that, that would typically be one that would um, use the larger one. So like quinacridone gold, for instance, uh, when we do quinacridone gold, that production run of that, uh, we will use the largest um, vessel for that because it's such a high volume, um, quick selling color. Uh, other colors, um, you know, say, let's just say um, um, some of our duochrome colors, um, they may end up being in, in the smaller ones because they don't sell this quickly. So we only have three ingredients to our paint. So we have uh, our pigment or our, our mineral, we have gum arabic, and we have distilled water. Why do you all think we use distilled water versus tap water? Tap water certainly would be cheaper, but what is it specifically in tap water that we don't like? <laughs> minerals, yes, Rhonda. Uh, specifically, what minerals do you, do you think could be in the, be in the water? Yep, Diane, chlorine is definitely in there. Mm-hmm. Calcium, peach, yes, very good. That's exactly what I was looking for. Um, I used to live in, in, a, in, the, in a farming community in, in central California and, and our water was just absolutely the hardest, hardest stuff you could ever imagine. I mean, uh, you would ha constantly have to uh, uh, clean, the, um, clean the calcium buildup off the shower um, because the water was so hard. Uh, so yes, that's one. And, you know, we're talking about uh, fluoride and, and chlorine and all those things. So what all of those things mean to Daniel Smith is uh, these are elements that actually create variables in our paint making process. And that's exact, exactly the opposite of what we don't want. We want to be able to count on the same thing every time. So if we use distilled water, because it doesn't have any of these, others, uh, uh, these other impurities in it, we know that we are always going to have a, a predictable outcome. So the other reason is, um, and this is something for, for you all to consider, um, is that when you have all of these things in, in your water, it's actually taken up space in the solution, uh, in, the, in the solution of, of water. So what ends up happening is when you introduce pigment to that, it wants to push the pigment away. So if you don't have any of those elements uh, in there pushing the pigment away, it makes your paint look slightly brighter and a, and a little bit more concentrated. So something very interesting to do from time to time is uh, go ahead and get a cup of tap water, get a cup of distilled water and get a cup of salt water and see if you can spot differences. Uh, sometimes the, the, you know, the differences are slight between tap water and distilled water, but um, it's really interesting to see what 
different effects you can make by using by adding salt to your solution of water and, and watch what happens there. What's really cool about it is if you um, if, if you just add just enough in it so that you can see the crystals uh, flowing through the water and what ends up happening when you when you paint with it is it, it actually makes colors that granulate granulate that much more. So it literally causes the, the granulation to, to just blow up because now you have these larger, um, larger particles in, in, your, uh, in your solution of paint. So it adds a really interesting and, and different effect. All right, so now that we have our three ingredients together, we go ahead and bring them to our mixing station. And this mixing station is, it's a very scaled down picture. Um, um, and it really doesn't show you exactly uh, how big it is. This machine is actually very, very big. And when we use it, we end up raising it up over 16 feet tall. So it, uh, it, we raise it up really high because we need to get the maximum revolution out of the blade or the shaft that, that turns. So in this, this mixing station actually uh, churns paint at a very high rate of speed. And what ends up happening is that because the blades are churning the paint, it creates what's called a venturi effect, which means it's turning so quickly that it's drawing air into the solution of paint. And um, it does a really good job of churning the paint, but there are two things that happen that we, um, that we don't especially like. Um, the first one is, is that uh, when you're turning uh, the paint that quickly and when you draw in uh, draw the air into the mixture of the paint, it tends to create static electricity. And that static electricity wants to draw the paint particles together and create what we call agglomerates, which is there's a picture there um, at the bottom. And basically what's happening is that all of those paint particles are, are tangled. And what that looks like to you as, as, as an artist, if you were to put your brush into that bucket that you see next to the mixing station and you were to try and paint it out, what you would notice is, is that uh, some part of your stroke would look fine. And then there would be other parts that would look very dull. And, um, and that's a result of those paint particles being tangled. What we want them to look like is what you see down there at the bottom where you have all of those circles um, and they're lined up linearly. And those that arrow, um, what you see there is actually light and, and the way that it exits uh, the paint particle. So we want all of those to be exactly the same, to look uniform because what, what happens there is when, those, um, when the light exits uniformly out of each of the paint particles, it makes the paint look brighter and it makes the paint look consistent. The other thing that happens so, when we're churning the I have paint. A quick question Go ahead. For you. Go ahead. So it looks like um, we had a question. I'm not sure if you mentioned it. Um, there, does this, it's back on your distilled versus tap water. Sure. Um, from Jan, does this mean we should ideally use distilled water when we paint? Um, and then Lynn asks, sea salt or regular salt? Got it, okay. The great thing about distilled water is, is that you always know what you're going to, you always know what the result is going to be. It'll produce, uh, it'll, it'll produce a result that you can replicate. Uh, yes, uh, there is slight, um, there is slight differences in terms of the uh, longevity of the color, the light fastness. Um, when you don't have uh, chemicals that are, that are in your paint, it causes, um, you take that element out of the, out of the equation and you have the paint in, in, a, in a position to where it was intended to be. So the answer to your question is yes, I absolutely would. Um, uh, especially some of you are so accomplished as, as artists. Um, it's so important for, for you to use, um, uh, use the best processes and, and, and the best pigments. Um, when you're, um, or pigments that, that have equal light fastness is probably where more what I'm getting at. So in the water and, and the type of water that you use, the distilled water versus uh, tap water, the distilled water uh, allows, uh, allows you to um, get to a place where you're gonna be able to replicate things and you're also gonna be able to 
um, guarantee the, the light fastness of the color. Uh, because when we test, uh, we, you know, we obviously use distilled water and that's how we come up with our assumptions. When you throw variables uh, into the process, it can, change the, uh, it can change the light fastness on the color. All right, sea salt or regular salt? I like using just regular table salt. Um, sea salt, I find uh, the, the granules are actually a little too large. So um, regular uh, iodized salt works just fine. All right. All right, uh, the other thing that, that happens in this scenario um, that we don't necessarily like um, is that uh, the, the process changes. I'm gonna go back, go back to this. What ends up happening is that when you turn the paint at that high rate of speed, it also changes the viscosity of the paint. Um, it, uh, at the end of this mixing station, the paint is almost like a heavy whipped cream. So it's not exactly uh, ready to go into a tube. So, um, so when you turn the paint like that, it changes the texture. So we have to figure out a way um, to be able to remove all of that air out of that paint. And the way that we do that is that we use what's called a, um, what's called a, dis a dispersion mill. And this is, a, this is a, another word for a dispersion mill is a three roll mill. So basically each of these cylinders are all spinning in opposite directions. And what ends up happening is that when the paint comes over the, the first cylinder, it hits that second one and it's like a train wreck happens. And the second cylinder tears apart all of the paint particles so that the gum Arabic can get in between each of the paint particles. And then as it comes around the second and hits the third, the same thing happens again and it rips them apart uh, again for, for the second time. The other thing that happens is that um, because of the tolerances are so close together between the cylinders, uh, the cylinders uh, actually crush all of the air out of the, out of the mixture of the paint and makes the paint to the viscosity um, to the way that we want it. So we basically will run uh, the, the batch of paint through this five or six times minimum, just so that we can get the texture and the um, and the brightness the way we, that we want it. So here's some um, here's some pictures of what it actually looks like inside of our inside of our factory. So this is what the what the three roll mill actually looks like. It's actually a very large machine. It probably weighs almost it, probably about fifteen hundred pounds. So it's extremely heavy. And so it starts on that far end, and then it moves towards the front. And what you see there that that triangle. Um, what you see there, we call that the apron, and that's where the paint um, exits the mill and into a bucket, which is what you see right there. So that's, um, that's a look uh, inside of our factory. And um, you can see there in the gentleman in the front, he kind of has a, a tool that he uses to um, move, uh, move the paint that kind of sometimes can puddle on the top and he moves it around. And then he also has another tool where it's almost like a squeegee and he squeegees the paint into that big bucket that you see down below or, or the vessel. So once the paint is to the right, um, really to, to, the, to the right texture and, and we have the uh, paint particles to the right size, um, we take it to our tube filling station. So our, our tube filling station is the only piece of automation that we have in our entire factory. So, and what ends up happening is, is that there's a carousel and we take, take one of our tubes and we turn it upside down, um, the crimp side. And, that, um, and on that side of the tube, we um, put, in the put the carousel in and then there's an applicator that goes down into the tube and injects the tube with the right amount of paint. And then as it comes out, it crimps the tube and also stamps a batch number on it. And that batch, or that batch number corresponds to one of these, uh, which is our paint out. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of this just for a second so you all can see this a little bit better. So we call these paint outs. And these are things that, that we develop um, after every batch of paint. 
And these uh, paint outs are numbered and they are the same number uh, that we stamp onto the tubes. So uh, we make a paint out um, with the number on it and it all corresponds to, all corresponds with the tube. So what ends up happening and why this is important is that say, uh, say you have a, a tube of uh, serpentine here and you really love it. And then you go and buy a, a, another tube and you start using it and the color is not the same. Something looks, something looks off. Well, you could go to Daniel Smith, give them a call on their 800 number and you'll say, hey, you know, I have this tube that I bought previously. I really loved it. And here's the batch number. And then here's this other tube that I just bought and, and the color just doesn't seem right to me. And then they'll take that number and then they'll come back and they'll bring these paint outs out and then they'll put them side by side. And then they'll say one of two things. They'll say, um, you know, maybe you have something there. Maybe we need to investigate a little bit more. Um, but the most likely answer is, um, did you, was your water clean when you were using this color? Um, because here, look, they match. So, um, so we, we hold on to these because we want to be able to, to be a resource uh, for you or artists in case you ever have questions. So if you ever have questions about a particular color that you have, um, make sure that you uh, keep the tube um, so that you can um, give us that batch number because that batch number will help us um, um, solve some of the mysteries. All right. We do have another little question. Um, about the making of the paint? Yes. So Diane asks, do you have a different machine for each color? Uh, Diane, yes, we have, we have basically, we can do three colors at a time. But um, if we need to, if we need to change colors, what we end up having to do is we end up having to steam clean um, all of our equipment um, to make sure that there's no contamination. So, um, so basically it, it's, a, it's a, a whole process that can take up to 24 hours um, for us to clean, um, clean our, our, our mills, our machinery, just so that we can um, pivot to a new color. So it it's, uh, takes, it takes a bit of time. You know, once we do a, once we do a batch, then it, then it takes usually around 24 hours for us to clean it. And then so that we can put that machine back in operation. All right, Let us, let's go back here. All right. So now that we are through the tubing process, it takes us to the kind of the next portion. Um, that, that kind of marks the end of the actual production of it. But from here, we do a lot of testing. Uh, the first uh, the first thing that, that we care about, or one of the most important things we care about is, is the light fastness of our color and also the information that we're, that we're able to provide you about that particular color. And, and one of the ways that we're able to provide you information about light fastness is to use this piece of machinery right here, which is called a xenon fadeometer. And this xenon fadeometer helps us to determine what the light fastness of the color is. So I'm going to show you this. Here's what it looks like on the inside. A little better than that black and white uh, photo from the previous page. So what you have in there is a carousel, uh, which holds all of the paint outs. Uh, we, use, we use our paint outs in there. And in the center of that machine, uh, if you see that, uh, that long, um, that long item that is sticking, uh, sticking out through the middle, um, there's actually a light bulb in there. And that light bulb produces a very, very, very bright amount of light. Basically, it's able to replicate over 120 years worth of light exposure in four days. It's extremely bright. Um, and it also gets extremely hot. We have to put distilled water down the center of that bulb. Otherwise, uh, the entire machine would actually melt. So it's, uh, uh, it gets extremely hot and it's extremely bright. So basically the light that it replicates is the same light that you and I see uh, basically at noon. And it replicates that sort of light intensity 
uh, for four days and it replicates 120 years worth of light exposure. It's pretty amazing. So depending upon the amount of fade that we see when we put them next to a template, depending upon the amount of fade helps us determine what the light fastness is of the color. All right. So the other machine that you see there is the photos is a what we call a photo spectrometer. And the photo spectrometer, uh, its job is to help us make sure that the colors, uh, that our colors uh, match from batch to batch. And um, what ends up happening is you see the black handle that you see on the front there, you can pull that away and then there's a glass window. And then what you would do is you would take your, uh, take a small chunk of your paint out and then put it in the window and then close that arm back up. And then that machine will basically chemically break down um, everything ab about that particular color and how it relates to uh, different batches. So it basically, it, we're looking for the same chemical numbers, the, the same balance of numbers um, from batch to batch. So what we'll do is we'll take a, a, a new batch and then we'll match it up a batch, say from 10 years ago and see if, um, see if the colors match. If the colors don't match, then we pull the paint from the shelves and basically go back to the um, go back to manufacturing and say hey there was an error made here we need to fix it so basically we we catch a, a lot of problems um, before it even leaves the building and this photo spectrometer actually helps us do it because it helps us to make sure that um, from batch to batch our colors are are uh, close to identical all right Let's talk about granulation for a moment. So granulation uh, is this effect right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bail out of here. And I'm gonna show you, go back to the main screen here. So granulation is this effect. So many of you have rec you know, can recognize it and know, know what it looks like, but do you actually know what causes it? So what ends up happening here is that the paint particles, um, either the, from, the, uh, from the pigment itself or, or the minerals, is heavier than the distilled water that it wants to sit in. And uh, the particles want to flow down to the bottom and flow into the tooth of the paper uh, where it creates this effect. And then the water and the gum arabic wants to float at the top. So uh, the pigment or the mineral wants to flow all through the tooth of the paper. And when it does that, it, it creates this effect. But let's take a step back and, and, and chat about what can we use granulation for? So I'm gonna show you a few different colors here and let's chat about what each of them could be used for. So here's the first one. Uh, this is a color called jadeite. What do you think we could use jadeite for? I love using jadeite for, uh, for foliage. Uh, I love using it for, um, for uh, basically spring. And then what I'll do for fall is that I'll go ahead and, and mix a little bit of quinacridone gold with uh, jadeite here. And it really gives me some beautiful fall foliage. So let's look at, let's look at another one um, and see what you all think. What about lapis lazuli? What could we use this for? Sky, water, yes. Thanks, Jane. Yep, other blues, absolutely. So here's the one thing that to me that, that, I, that I really learned about colors that granulate is that they do a much better job of replicating what nature can do than I can with my brush or my pen. So a color that granulates makes it so that I don't have to worry about details as much as I used to. So, uh, because what it wants to do is create something that looks more natural uh, than something that I can interpret and then uh, illustrate through, through a brush or a pen. So uh, if you wanna create more natural effects, 
consider using colors that granulate because the, they have a, a a way about them that's that's uh, that better articulates what what nature can do. So, and when for me that what what ended up changing with that is that it changed my perspective and and how I paint. So I don't paint with as much detail anymore. Um, I change my perspective and I and I actually stand back now. And uh, when I don't have to worry about the details, I really feel like uh, things flow better, and that I'm not stuck in in areas where uh, where um, where I can get bogged down or, or, or lose my or, or lose my creativity. Um, so things stay free flowing. So granulation really can can open up the flow of your work. Rhonda, all right. There seem to be very few yellow or red granulating colors. Is there a reason known for that? Well, Rhonda, it has everything to do with the with the pigment itself. Actually, um, some uh, some pigments. Um, depending upon their particle size, uh, tend to lend themselves to granulating or not granulating. So um, that brings up a great example. Um, let's let me show you this. I'm going to show you two colors here. Uh, this is ultramarine, and then this is French ultramarine. So these two come from the exact same pigment. The exact same. And when you look, if we were to look at the color chart right now, what you would notice is there's absolutely nothing different with these two colors. But when you put them close together and compare the two, there is something absolutely different about them. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do something a little bit different here. I'm going to use a different camera because I want you guys to be able to see this a little bit better. So here, here are the two colors side by side. But there is actually differences between the two. So what do you all see um, that's different between these two? Does one granulate more than the other? Yeah, the French granulates more than, than the ultra. And there's a reason for that. It's because the paint particles are different sizes. So the French has, has, the, larger, has the larger particle and it's 10 microns. And when those particles are bigger, it makes the granulation look bigger because the particles are bigger and, um, and it, allows, it also allows for the light to um, become more evident in, in, the, um, in the paint particle. So, and what, what I mean by that is the color, the French actually looks a little warmer than the ultra and that's because that the particle is bigger and the light um, has um, plays differently with particles that are bigger versus ones that are smaller. So um, the ultra, because it's smaller, you know, obviously has less granulation. But, but since those particles are smaller, they're closer together, and that creates more of a cool look. So when we talk about warm and cool colors, we're able to change the the, the warmth of a color simply by manipulating what the particle size is. So particle size makes makes a huge difference. Um, does Daniel Smith make a set of granulating colors? Uh, yes and no. So yes, we have uh, we have a set called our Primatex set, and those are all colors that uh, come from our um, uh, that are mineral based, and and uh, the vast majority of our colors uh, have. Um, have granulation in, in the Primatech collection. So uh, that would be something to check out. And um, you can also, um, when you look at that set, you could use your color chart, which I'm hoping everybody has today, and you can double check all of that information for yourselves. All right, let's go back. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, quinacridone. So quinacridone is, is, is a very interesting subject. It's, it's uh, uh, one of the more dynamic ones that we have to work with as artists. And um, let's, let's just talk about some, just some basic terms. So what does quinacridone mean? Basically quinacridone means five rings. So quin for five, cridone actually means rings. So five rings. 
So uh, we give you, if you look at the top there of page 11, what you see there is actually the, the, um, the structure, the chemical structure of what quinacridone actually looks like under a microscope. And um, we actually even break down what quinacridone is um, as a formula. So if you look there, you see that the chemical formula is, is a combination of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. In those amounts, um, we get the pigment quinacridone. Quinacridone actually uh, was discovered in the 1890s, and it was uh, discovered by a German scientist uh, who um, discovered it one day, but, didn't it, but it didn't end up being mass produced until the 1950s by the DuPont Corporation. So anybody wanna guess which industry uh, originally uh, quinacridones were actually made for? Let's see. Yes, auto. It was the auto industry. Uh, they made them for the automotive industry. Uh, so basically, um, a lot of these um, beautiful colors that we see in our quinacridone range um, um, actually got their start in the automotive industry. So here's an interesting question. What do you think is the actual amount of pigment produced for our purposes as artists, uh, for the art material industry? Does anybody want to guess? It's very, very small. Let's put it that way. How about 0.1%? 0.1% of the pigment that, that is produced for us as artists, that's all it represents to the total pigment production in the entire world. So there's only five pigment producers in, in the entire world, which is very interesting. So what do you all think? I mean, we already know that the automotive industry uses a, uh, uses a lot of pigment and they're number one, but what do you think are the other two industries that use a lot of pigment? How about house paint? House paint is number three. Aviation? No, aviation is actually very small. No. Fabric? No. How about plastics? Plastics are, are the number two uh, users of pigment in, in the entire world. So automotive is number one, plastics is number two, and house paint is number three. Those are the three top industries. And we are all the way down at 0.1%. Pretty amazing. Yes, that's, uh, that is for all of art materials, not just watercolor. Pretty amazing. All right. So let's show you a few other little things here. So we're very unique. Uh, we have uh, 14 uh, individual colors of quinacridone. So we have basically just this amazing spread of color. We can go all the way from, from the oranges and, and, and uh, almost yellows with quinacridone gold, um, all the way over to quinacridone purple. So we have this, uh, this amazing uh, spance of, of color and it's really interesting the way that they're able to do this. Um, I'm gonna go back and, and if you see the last ring there on the left, uh, we call that the beta ring. And what we're able to do is we're able to, or chemists are able to alter that, uh, that last ring chemically and it changes the way that light refracts when it hits it and when it refracts at a different angle, our eye sees a different color. So depending upon how we alter that last ring determines, how, determines what color our eye sees. So we're able to do a lot of different things with chemistry with, with quinacridone pigments. Um, it's just, just amazing. So things, other things that are really interesting about uh, quinacridone is uh, there's no granulation associated with these at all. Um, Go ahead and I'm gonna get out of this so that you can see my camera a little bit better. And this is quinacridone deep gold. Do you see any, any granulation 
with quinacridone deep cold? It's fair. It, it, what, let me put it this way. What you do see is, is actually the result of, of, a, of, of the paper that we use uh, to do our paint outs on. So basically there's no granulation in the, and, the, and there's a reason for that. So each of the paint particles is the same size, the same shape and the same weight. So there's not one that's higher, there's not one that's shorter, wider, heavier, none of that. They're all the same. So what ends up happening is, you know, think about a jigsaw puzzle for a moment. What would happen if all of those pieces in a jigsaw puzzle were exactly the same? Well, what you would end up what would end up happening is that each of those pieces would come together seamlessly. And that's why we don't see granulation because if, when you have all of those pieces and they're exactly the same, they come together very seamlessly and that's why we don't have granulation. So that's why they're always so wonderful for, for use uh, for, for use like when, when we do washes and things like that. Um, uh, because uh, there's, there's uh, none of those uh, um, uh, variables or, or differences in, in the size of the pigment, uh, since they're all the same, they all come together and then there's just no variance. So that's why we don't have any, um, that's why we don't have any granulation and why they're so perfect uh, for doing washes and things like that. The other interesting thing also to note is that they're extremely light fast. Uh, these are, are like, these are super, super, super light fast. Matter of fact, most of them are so light fast that our xenon phadometer can't even accurately determine the light fastness because they are so far off the chart. So they are abs absolutely amazing pigments to work with for sure. All right, go back here. All right. So that kind of ends the paint making process for, for us. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point? I'm loving the questions, keep them coming. You guys always have good questions. I always enjoy hanging out with you all because you guys are, are very thoughtful with, with your questions and it's always a lot of fun to, um, to go over things with you. So feel free to put them in the chat if you have questions. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, where some of our minerals come from. And I actually have um, quite a few of them here with me and um, We'll go ahead and, and look at a look at a few. And uh, we talked about Amazonite already. Go ahead. Yep, we actually did get a couple questions in. If you want to take a yeah, look let's at do it. Them. Yeah, no problem. Okay, we do have a question from Wendy. She asked what uh, kind of paper for the paint outs, and we also have one from Peach who asked where can we see some of your work, Scott. <laughs> well, I am I, I am working on a on a few things. A lot of my work um, surround. I like doing abstracts and things like that. Um, so I am working on trying to get my Instagram kind of put together. But um, I have uh, I have I have a dual job. I'm a sales rep and and a brand ambassador, and that definitely keeps keeps me away from from the studio more than I want to. Um, but I'm working on it, so uh, maybe uh, maybe when I get some time over Christmas, I'll I'll get my Instagram kind of put together with with a few things that I'm working on. All right, uh, Wendy, Wendy, Wendy asks, what kind of paper for the paint outs? Uh, Daniel Smith internally likes to use a a, a, a paper called uh, Lana or Lawn Aquarel. Um, it's not very um, it, it's not very well known here in in, in the states. Um, it is very nice paper. Uh, I would say that it's texture wise, it's between uh, um, a Fabriano and, a, and an Arsh, um, kind of in, in that, in, in terms of texture and, and feel. Um, they, um, um, they're, so basically the, this is just a preference um, that John, uh, John the owner has. Um, he likes using um, uh, Lana, just because it's it it has the texture that that he wants. Okay, um, Diane, uh, on your paint chart, what does the big circle with the number represent? And that is directly on the color. Well, we're almost to the color chart, Diane, and and um, we'll talk about that then. But just uh, just so that we can talk about it now, real quick. Um, that is the series number. So series has to do with, with the price 
of that particular color. So we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit in, in a few minutes, promise. Okay, so let's look at a few of these minerals. I'm gonna um, switch out and look um, and show you the, the camera where I can zoom in on things. So we're gonna go out here. So I showed you a little bit of, of this color. I held them up, but this is a, a mineral called kyanite. And this is what it looks like. I'm gonna move him out of the way. So this is kyanite. We get it from South America. And um, it's really beautiful. This color, it's, it's tough. The camera has a tough time picking up, but there is a ton of mica associated with these colors, uh, with this color here in particular. Uh, if you um, look at the mineral, I, I can turn it in a certain way and then you'll get it just a little glimpse, a little bit of shimmer. And that shimmer actually will translate to the paper. And you can see it a little bit here. So it's really a beautiful color. So this is kyanite. This is zoocyte. And zoocyte looks like this. And I'm gonna turn it so that you all can see. See the red there in the mineral, in the zoocyte? Those are actually rubies. So uh, zoocyte is actually where you, where we get um, where we get rubies from. And we actually believe we get this from Alaska. This is tiger's eye. And tiger's eye we get from, we get from South Africa. And it's really gorgeous. It actually has, um, uh, almost an iridescence to it. Let me get it up there a little closer so you can see that. But it's it's really a beautiful color. It creates a very nice uh, warm brown. Uh, great for trees. It also has a, has a lot of nice granulation associated with it. So what's um, pretty cool is that uh, when we want to make a, a, a variant, we, we decided we wanted to make a variant of this color. So what we ended up doing is that we ended up putting this uh, in a kiln for about eight hours. And what ended up happening was that it, it changes the, um, um, it changes the structure of the mineral and makes it a lot darker and not only just darker on, on the exterior, but also on the interior. And when it, after a period of about eight hours in that kiln, it, it now looks like this. Still has a little bit of shimmer, um, but, Still, uh, still, it's a little bit different. Um, the other thing you really notice about this mineral too is that um, it's actually very heavy and that's because it has uh, iron in it. Uh, they have a lot of iron, so it feels really heavy and, and they're actually magnetic too. You could take uh, one of your kitchen magnets and it would wanna stick to this. And the colors uh, that, and then the, the color itself, here's, here's the difference in, in the actual color. So the darker is the, um, burnt tiger's eye, and then the left is the, I guess, uh, uh, the original version. Pretty neat. And then there's the beautiful amethyst. We actually do use real amethyst when we make our minerals, or when we make um, when we make this particular color. Um, uh, amethyst is a really interesting color. Uh, it has a lot of granulation and uh, sometimes, um, it's not in every batch, which is kind of interesting, but sometimes um, you do get a little shimmer out of these because they really do have a, a, a lot of mica uh, actually associated with them. But it's a beautiful, deep, uh, deep purple. All right. Um, I think we have a few questions. All right. That. Okay. Um, um, uh, Laura. Hi, Laura. Um, my materials didn't arrive yet. Will this 
Will I have this chart included? Yes, you will. Uh, when you receive your uh, when you receive your kit, it'll have a color chart in there, and you'll be able to um, um, look at all of the information that's associated with the minerals. All right, I'm going to go back here and do this. So uh, this color here uh, is rhodonite, and rhodonite is a, a really bright and beautiful. Uh, uh, red. So I, a lot of times I get asked, um, you know, specifically, uh, hey, what about, you know, is is there a solution or, or a different alternative to opera pink? Because opera pink tends to want to fade. And, and a lot of times I'll suggest this color. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is rhodonite. And rhodonite is, is a, a really, um, it's really different. Number one, it doesn't have any granulation associated with it. You can see. So there's uh, no granulation with it, which is really makes it unusual uh, from from the other permatech minerals that are um, that are in this um, category. Um, and the other amazing thing is that even though it's this bright, it still has a light fastness rating of over 100 years. So it's 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 a very nice alternative if you're looking for a uh, a, um, a a light fast version of of um, of opera pink. All right, Sleeping Beauty turquoise. So this is Sleeping Beauty here. And we get it from the Sleeping Beauty mine in Arizona. So a lot of people have said, well, where do you get the names of these colors? And, and a lot of times we, we name them from, from the mine in, in which we get them from. So um, this is one example. Um, so this comes from uh, the Sleeping Beauty mine, which is about 200 miles south of Phoenix. The interesting thing is that um, this mine is actually no longer producing, is no longer producing turquoise. It's actually producing copper. And the reason why that is, is that they mined it, they, they, they mined for turquoise so deep that they ended up hitting the water table and the whole mine filled with water. So now on the far end of, of the mine, um, it actually is producing copper instead of turquoise now. So, and it's been a while, it's been since 2006, uh, since, uh, since it's uh, stopped producing turquoise. So very interesting. Uh, another one um, that similar, not a similar story, but kind of comes from Arizona is kind of a really beautiful sister, co uh, sister color that we call Kingman green turquoise. Beautiful color, um, lots of wonderful uses for that, for, for water and, and um, uh, lots of different um, natural uh, things that, that um, Kingman green turquoise could um, help, uh, help with. And then here's sodalite. This is sodalite here. And sodalite is a beautiful, um, beautiful deep um, blue um, that granulates like crazy. It's a, it's a granulating monster, this one is. All right, question down there. So is Sleeping Beauty turquoise still available? Found it on the on the back of the chart. Yes, um, we have quite a bit of that left. Um, we um, we had an indication a, a number of years ago that that um, that eventually that this could happen. So we ended up buying an, an, an extra large uh, allotment of Sleeping Beauty turquoise. So we're going to be fine with that for 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 the foreseeable future for sure. All right, uh, right. All right, 37 colors on the color chart, um, but it says 37. So yes, there is 37 uh, total, um, 35, 35. We'll look at that together because um, it should be that, um, that we all have the, um, the most updated color chart which has 37 colors. So um, if that's the case, Carol, then um, we'll go ahead and send you out uh, an updated color chart. That one, that one may, may have slipped through the cracks. 
All right. Let's move on to the color chart while we're there. Oops, don't do that. Yeah, there we go. And here we are. Okay, so here's the color uh, cover, cover of the color chart. And this is what it looks like on the main side or the, the long side. So um, let's go ahead and, and get your color chart out and, and we'll look at those together. And um, this is the side of the color chart that I consider to be like our general line. And what you have here are colors uh, that, are that are synthetic pigments, but also some natural ones too. So ones that um, are made from uh, like umbers and, and uh, ochres and things like that. So all of those will be on this side. Now, what you have here on the back side of the color chart is where we have um, our mineral colors and also our um, luminescent colors. So uh, the so all of the Primatech colors, if it's made from a mineral, um, it's going to be on this side of the color chart. Down below, you have our luminescent colors. And then these are the colors that are our interference, iridescent, or what we call uh, duochrome. So here's a good example of, of, um, of a duochrome color. And this is one, uh, a lot of the questions that I get is how, how is a duochrome color different um, from some of the others in, in the collection? And um, as you can see here, what's really interesting is that on the right side, you have uh, basically a, a gessoed background, a dark background or, or um, a black watercolor ground background. And then on the left, you have just um, plain, you know, plain white paper. So depending upon uh, the surface and in, in which you use these colors on, you get two drastically different results. So as you can see here, the, uh, this is the duochrome saguaro green. So on the, on the dark side with the black watercolor ground, you get this really beautiful green. And then on the left, you have, uh, you have this warm brown. So, and that's really uh, kind of um, the way that these kind of work. So uh, when you look at it um, on, a, on a white background, it looks one color. And then when you introduce it to a darker background, it actually looks something completely different. So, and that's, um, and, and kind of in a nutshell, that is what, um, what our duochrome colors do. So depending upon uh, the surface in which you have it on, um, determines whether you're gonna get one effect or the other. There's another view of it. And then we also have uh, interference and iridescent pigments. So just to kind of give you some definition on, on, on what each of them means. So when we have a iridescent uh, color, it's a reflection. So the particle of light hits the paint pigment matrix and bounces back. So it bounces back much uh, like a mirror. It, it reflects, it reflects back. And, um, and iridescent colors can really be used on, on either white surfaces uh, or they can be on uh, dark surfaces. Now, interference colors, those colors refract light. So basically they, they take light uh, into the matrix and then it bends it or, or changes the, traje the trajectory on the way out. And when it does that, it changes the way that the, that the color looks. And the duochrome is like what we just described. So you have uh, one pigment that bounces between two colors. So, um, so and then that, that's at, those colors are at the bottom of uh, the color chart along with, um, along with other colors that are pearlescent and, and opalescent. All right, so go ahead to the main side of the color chart and go up to the very, very top and look next to the uh, look next to the word uh, watercolor uh, in the title and what you see is this it'll say color information and basically this area of the color chart is basically the the uh, legend to the map per se 
Um, here is where we help break down all of these uh, individual little codes um, that you see um, on the tube of the paint and also on the color chart. So the first piece of information that we give you is what is the color available in? So the color is gonna be available in one of these formats. So it's gonna be available in a 15 mil tube, which is that large tube right there. It's gonna be available in a watercolor stick, a five mil tube, and also a half pan. So those are the, those are the four different formats um, that it can come in. So, um, I always get a lot of questions about the watercolor sticks. So what the watercolor stick is, it's the, it's the pigment or the mineral uh, mixed with the gum Arabic, and that's it. We don't add um, the distilled water to them. And when, uh, when we do that, it kind of comes out as almost like this doughy uh, type of consistency. And at that point, we, we extrude it um, into something that creates the shape of the stick. And it comes out um, in, a, in it's basically about two to three inches long. Um, let me grab one here for you so we can see it in what it looks like in real size. Um, go ahead and do this. Show you this here. So it's that size. So it's, it's about the size of a, of a crayon almost. And um, what's really interesting about these that is that because they're dry, they uh, make it a lot easier um, to be portable with. Um, I don't know if any of you uh, have traveled, uh, traveled on an airplane with, uh, uh, with tubes of paint, but sometimes what, what ends up happening is that when you do that, uh, the uh, tube itself, when you go to open it, it wants to um, it wants to burp, and then paint gets all over your fingers, and it's just no fun to travel with. So these uh, watercolor crayons are are very very, uh, are, or excuse me, these um, watercolor sticks are, are very very nice to travel with because number one, they're dry, um, and you don't have to worry about um, getting uh, things that are liquid through security. So they're, they're very nice, they're very portable, and they're very, very concentrated. So one of these sticks is the equivalent to three full pans of watercolor. All right, we got a few questions here. Um, Peach, Peach made the remark that the red fuchsia, the fuchsia is uh, genuine, is very, very sparkly, it's gorgeous. Yes, it is. And um, it, that sparkle actually um, uh, comes through uh, to the paint, actually. It, it creates some very gorgeous effects. Uh, another question is, if I mix a fugitive color with one that is very light fast, will that affect the light fastness of the mixture? Uh, the answer to your question is yes, it does. So when you bring those two together, um, you're going to lose that light fastness and it's going to bring down uh, the number of years um, that that mixture of color brings. So you have to be very careful about what colors you decide to mix with others. Okay. Let's get back to the color chart here. All right, so we make watercolor sticks in 51 colors. And um, uh, all the same price point, by the way, they're all, they're all uh, in the mid $14 range and we don't have series numbers with, with each of these. All right, um, so like I mentioned before, we also have half pans and uh, we uh, hand pour all of our half pans. So uh, we, what we do is it's a three-step process. So the first pour basically gets us a third of the way. And then we have to wait uh, until all of the uh, water evaporates out of, out of the first pour. And then after that happens, and then we go on to the second pour then we basically repeat the, uh, the same steps until we get to the third, which uh, more or less uh, tops off the half pan. So um, once again, you know, we, we make them, they're all done by hand. Um, we make them in our factory in Seattle. Um, and it can literally take months um, um, to, to finish um, one batch of, uh, of making half pans because uh, we have to wait for the individual uh, um, uh, each of these half pans, they have to evaporate um, to the point to where we can add the, um, 
add the next pour. So we have um, 45 open stock colors now, and we also have nine sets in half pan. So uh, we have a, a, a very nice offering in terms of uh, color um, that we can give you in, the, in this format now. All right. So second piece of information that we give you is the light fastness rating. So uh, a, if you see a Roman numeral one, you know that that color has excellent light fastness and it'll be uh, over 100, 100 years without fading. Uh, a number two, uh, to a Roman numeral two, means that that color has very good light fastness. So that's over 100 years. A three is for us is fair and that means that that color will, will be light fast for 50 to 70 years. And then lastly, any color that, that starts to fade within 15 to 20 years for us is something that we designate as a fugitive color. So um, I'll, give you an easy, I'll give you an easy one. Um, we know that opera pink is a fugitive color, but there's another red out there that, that we probably all have used from one time or another um, that is also fugitive. That's, that's very common. Anybody want to guess? All right. Alizarin crimson. Yes, Rhonda, very good. Uh, Alizarin crimson is a fugitive color. Uh, it wants to turn bright pink when, um, when it finally starts to, uh, uh, when it starts to fade. So, um, so yes, and, and then that's exactly why we, we created a permanent version of it. So what's the difference between uh, permanent Alizarin crimson and the original alizarin crimson. So basically the original alizarin crimson uh, is only made with one pigment. The new alizarin crimson is actually made with three pigments and all of them are light fast. So, um, so it takes us three pigments to synthesize what the single pigment looks like. So even though it's, it's, um, it uses three pigments, um, it's still actually very light fast and actually blends very well with, with other colors. And it has everything to do with the way that we actually bring uh, colors with multiple pigments together. Uh, what we do that's different is that when we blend our pigments uh, together to make, uh, to make a new color, what ends up happening is we blend them together in, in, our, in our mixing vessel but we don't add the gum arabic or the distilled water to it. Uh, when we add the distilled water to it and the gum arabic, it changes the way that the uh, color uh, chemically reacts with the other colors that we're blending it with. So what we find is, is that when we blend the colors together when they're dry, static electricity forms and causes the paint particles to want to come together electrostatically. And then when you add the gum arabic and the distilled water, it then, uh, it then actually makes this combination of pigments perform more like a single pigment. So, it's, so when you have that, then it allows you the ability to continue blending and not have to worry about making mud at that point. All right, um, another question is, yes, we talked about, there is a permanent version of one right now. And it's uh, basically uh, two colors down on the color chart to the right. All right. Let's go back. Oops, wrong way. There. All right. So the next piece of information we give you is whether the color is uh, uh, staining or non-staining. So this is really important for us because we like making a, a different textural effects on, on our work. And depending upon the color that we use um, helps us um, determine really how much of that effect can we, can we, actually, um, can we actually pull off. So I'm showing you uh, four different colors here and each of them have, have a different staining ability. So, and that staining ability is, in, uh, direct, is 
directly reference how easily we can lift certain colors. So this is a this is a great example that the, that Daniel Smith put together that I thought was pretty interesting. So uh, up there at the top is cobalt pink, and that is a non-staining color. So as you can see uh, through that one streak there, um, that we're able to pull up almost 99% of the color. So, and that helps us if, if we wanna create some very interesting like uh, 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 cloud, uh, like with, with a cloud texture, um, we know that with a non-staining color that we're gonna be able to pick up a lot of that color. Now the Hansa, Hansa yellow medium is a low staining color. So we can still do, we can still do our, our, our lifting, our lifting technique, but you're not gonna be able to lift as much. And then down below that, we have indent thrown blue, uh, which is a three, which is a medium staining color. So now we're able to lift less color yet. And then finally down at the bottom, we have carmine and carmine is a highly staining color and it does not uh, like to lift. Um, it uh, doesn't like the lift so that we can get our textural effects. So all of these things are, are, are very important to keep in mind as, as you're laying out your palette and what you intend to create with each of these colors. So if, you, if your intention is to create uh, some texture um, and want to use a lifting technique, then it's important to know the characteristic of the color so you know exactly how much pigment you're going to be able to pull up. So it's all, all with a, um, and we, we show this to you on the color chart in, in a one through four system. So next is whether the color granulates or not. So we wanna be able to let you know which colors granulate and, and which ones don't. So remember it, it's whether um, these colors uh, can produce this kind of effect. So um, um, this is granulation. So we tell you which colors granulate and which ones don't. So an N equals no, which is kind of like what you saw with the quinacridone colors. And yes um, is for these types of colors. Uh, this, this color is actually a, a zoocyte. Um, and and uh, so on the color chart, we let you know which colors uh, granulate and which ones don't. So the next thing that, that I think is actually the most important thing to discuss is the transparency of the color. All right, we have a question. All right. How much of this notation is on the tube? Uh, certain, not all of this information is on the tube. Um, so having a color chart to be able to reference, reference is important. Uh, we, do, um, we do give you, for instance, the, um, uh, the light fastness we give you the um, we give you the um, uh, the uh, number uh, where the where the um, pigment sits and that is about it. So we give you the light fastness and we and we give you the pigment in, in which you use to use it. All right. So transparency, transparency is really important to understand. If, if you understand transparency, then you'll end up making uh, wiser choices with your palette. So a lot of the times, at least the, the way that, that I used to be is I would just look at the color, fall in love with the color, and then that color is on my palette. Um, I never really looked at uh, the different um, uh, the different things that were associated with the color, or the different characteristics that were associated with the color. And one of the ones that, that over time that I came to realize were, uh, was most important to me was understanding the transparency of the color. So here's an example of kind of um, how it works. So um, at the very top there, you see uh, quinacridone uh, burnt orange. And um, you know, a lot of the 99% of the quinacridones are are transparent. So here you can see uh, uh, quinacridone burnt orange over black watercolor ground. And because you can't see any of the, um, the actual uh, quin burnt orange color on the dark side, that tells you that, that the color is transparent. So here's what semi-transparent looks like. 
So on the left there, you have uh, permanent red. And then on the right side, once again, you have the um, dark gesso or, or, the, or the dark uh, watercolor ground. And now what you're able to see is uh, basically uh, something where you can see uh, a little bit of the color, um, but still it's predominantly black. And then down below, you have um, this color. This is actually um, uh, chromium green, um, uh, cobalt, um, cobalt chromium green. And what, what you have here is this is a color that is totally opaque. So it does a pretty good job of, of wiping out the black. So, um, so in this instance, you can kind of see how we view transparency and, and the way that's helpful to you as artists is that you get a better understanding of how uh, transparent colors might interact with other colors that you work with. So let me ask you this. What happens when you blend a transparent color with an opaque color? What ends up happening? Whose nature does, does the color want to take on at that point? Anybody? Yes, peach, thank you. It's opaque. Uh, it wants to take on the opaque colors nature. So, and all of that's really good to know, right? Because uh, we want to be able to predict how other colors are going to react when we blend them together um, um, with other colors. So it's, it's important to know what the opacity or, or the transparency of the color is. Um, before you decide to blend with them, because you, as if you don't, you, you may come up with a, with a combination that, um, um, that you may not have wanted. So understanding transparency is very important. So the way that we lay that out on the color chart is that you have a, whoops, let's back up just a little bit back there. So with the transparency, so you have an open circle, that means that color is fully transparent. A half, a uh, half circle means that that color is a semi-transparent. And then that fully darkened circle means that it's opaque. So understanding all of this is really important. Um, not only does it will help you choose um, colors more wisely, but it also will help you to kind of think two and three steps ahead um, with, with your work so that you can better plan uh, to have um, that, to be able to anticipate different things, different effects. So let's see if you got it. So we already discussed what that um, circled uh, number means. So that means that it's the series numbers. So what's next? Uh, what is the first piece of information that we give you there? It's what the color is available in, right? So ultramarine blue here is available in a 15 mil tube, a five mil tube, a watercolor stick, and also a half pan. So, all right, somebody help me out with the next one. What, is, uh, what does that next symbol mean? Ah, there we go. It's the light fastness. Thank you, Laura. So that Roman numeral one means that that color is light fast for over a hundred years. All right, what's the next piece? What's the next piece of info? There we go. Yes, it's the staining ability of the color. So what is the number three? Yes, yep, absolutely right. It's a medium staining color. So this is a color that, um, that is gonna be fairly aggressive uh, in, in sticking to the fibers of your paper. So your lifting ability is gonna be, slight, is gonna be diminished with a medium staining color. All right, what's next? Yes. The color granulate. So uh, Y equals uh, yes. So that means yes, that that color will granulate. Um, if you had an N there, that means that that color does not granulate. 
All right. What's next? You guys are lightning fast. Transparency, yes. So, and that color is fully transparent. So very interesting thing going on here. Very interesting thing to consider. So this color is a medium staining color. So it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. It's also, uh, it's also, it also granulates and it's also transparent. So that's a very interesting combination of, of uh, characteristics right there. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, fairly aggressive but yet it granulates, but, it, but it's also transparent. So very, very interesting. So what do those letters and numbers mean uh, underneath there? Does everybody see the PB29? So that's actually the pigment information. So P is always gonna stand for pigment. What do you, uh, the, the second letter uh, actually always relates to the color family in which it comes from. So where does, uh, so that letter B there, what does that letter B represent, do you think? Blue, very good. Uh, color on the pigment wheel, yes. Um, it's the, it also rep, and the 29 represents the shade or the color position. So. Um, think about this. So when you go to our manufacturing or our pigment manufacturer in, in Europe and you look at his reference materials, it's always going to start with the darkest shade first. And that darkest shade is always going to be number one. And then progressively, as he changes the shades, it goes to two, three, four, five. And then in this case, 29. So PB29 is, is actually the color of the pigment. And PB29, that also relates to kind of an international standard that, that's out there um, that is used by um, uh, pigment manufacturers to give artists an idea of what the shade kind of looks like. Now, it's not always an exact match because one of the things that is very interesting that the pigment manufacturers do is that they create subshades for each of these shades. So have you ever noticed, for instance, like say a Daniel Smith Prussian blue looks slightly different than the Windsor Newton Prussian blue? Well, it's because that the pigment manufacturer has different shades, uh, for uh, different subshades for each of these shades. So why would they do that? Well, quite simply, Daniel Smith wants you to fall in love with their Prussian blue, so they want it to be slightly different so people will know that it looks slightly different, but yet it doesn't take them so far away from the original shade that they have to think about a different, um, a different blending technique or, or, a different, um, or, a, or a different interpretation. So for every one of these um, shades, there could literally be 50 to 60 different subshades of every one of these shades. It's very interesting. All right, are there any questions about the color chart? All right. Well, here's what we're gonna do. So everybody, everybody got a, uh, went ahead and, and they got a couple different dot cards. Um, most of them should have a uh, Primatech dot card, which has a representation of our uh, Primatech collection. And then the other one should be one of, one of our other artist dot cards. Uh, the paper that's in the pack, um, by the way, is the Fabriano Artistico. Um, it's the um, extra bright and it's 140 pound cold press. Great question. Okay, so I'm gonna move some things out of the way and we're going to, um, we're not gonna be able to get to all, all of the colors, but I'm just gonna do a, do a selection of them and paint them out for you and, and let, let you see some of them. Um, um, and at the end, um, at the end of this, I actually have a, um, I have a list of all of the colors that, that I'm using. So it's, um, um, and it'll be closely, it'll be, it'll be pretty close to what, what you all have. All right, uh, Laura, uh, Laura uh, it's interesting to me that the ultramarine blue and the French ultramarine blue have the exact same information and yet your color card showed much more granulation on the French. 
wish you could break down the granulation a bit more. Yeah, that's, it's, it's really tough. And, you know, trust me, I, I get that question quite a bit, but, you know, uh, the differences in, in, in the way that they granulate um, uh, depends upon the actual weight of the pigment itself. So each of the pigment, um, each of the pigments will, um, depending upon the way that we decide to reduce down the pigment, changes the granulation of that. So, and we haven't been able to come up with a scale per se, like it, in an ideal world, uh, I think it would be fun to have like a one through four uh, rating to kind of rate what the, what the granulation is. Um, but we're not quite there yet, but um, I'll definitely pass that one along because I think that's a, a, um, a, an interesting uh, way of looking at it and, and would also be very helpful to artists. Uh, Diane asked, what weight was the paper? So Diane, the weight of the paper is 140 pound cold press. All right. Um, Laura, you also mentioned if the color chart could be broken down into cool versus warm. And um, you know, what's very interesting about that is that um, there's a lot of different interpretations as to what colors are cool and which ones are, are, are warm. So um, it, it's all kind of dependent upon um, in, in the eye of the beholder per se. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, and paint out some of these colors and I'm gonna change, we're gonna get out of the screen share and I'm gonna, change my camera around so that we can so you can kind of see what I'm doing with my hands. And the first color I'm going to show you is uh, Amazonite. And Amazonite is that um, beautiful aqua color. And I really like it for, for a lot of different things. Um, I really like blending with it because I, it really gives me a lot of uh, a lot of warmth but yet doesn't overpower. I'm gonna go ahead and get a little bit of water here. And this is Amazonite. And it, it's really beautiful. It flows really well. It has a, a very nice warm turquoise. Oops, back up here. It's very warm. It's very, um, very pliable. Um, so many different things that you could use this for. All right, the next color is amethyst. Amethyst is a deep, deep, deep purple. And it is uh, very, very, um, very, very dark. You have to watch it with, uh, with uh, amethyst. It really is pretty powerful. And just a little bit of it really goes a long way. And it is so beautiful. It's highly granulating, uh, lots of different textural effects that you can, um, you can get using this color, uh, uh, using a stippling uh, type of approach with, uh, with a paper towel. Uh, but with this, this color, it just gives you a, a dense and beautiful purple. All right. All right. Next color is going to be a, um, it's, it's called diopside green. And it is very beautiful. It's, it's much different than, um, than jadeite and some of the other colors that have a, um, uh, that have a really um, deep mass tone. This actually has a little bit of brightness associated with it. And it's really beautiful. You could really use uh, this for, for a lot of different things, especially for, for, uh, for a spring palette. And also, I, I wanted to let you all know also, um, uh, that Plaza um, stocks all 260 of our colors, by the way. Uh, so if any of these colors that I show you today that you that you're interested in, um, feel uh, feel free uh, to, to reach out to um, 
uh, to Bruce there in Nashville, or you all could also um, go on to plazaart.com and you can also um, buy the color that way also. All right, uh, the next color uh, by comparison um, is green appetite. So this is, this is my go-to green if, if I'm working uh, with uh, landscapes. And it's wonderful because it has, uh, it has kind of a two-tone uh, uh, color associated. It's, it's a two-tone uh, color. So it has uh, some beautiful uh, warm um, brown uh, that kind of likes to flow through it. And it really can make some um, just beautiful, uh, beautiful fall foliage or grass. And sometimes what I'll do, this is just kind of how my mind works, is that I'll take uh, quinacridone, a little bit of quinacridone gold, and I'll take it and I'll do a little bit, a little bit with the quinacridone gold and that quinacridone gold really kind of um, pumps, pumps up some really beautiful color. Come down here. And do that a little bit more. A little bit of that. And you get just these wonderful, these wonderful plays on, on color that we see in foliage. All right. So here is jadeite by comparison. So jadeite is, is going to be your Primatech version of deep sap green. And it is a very, very, it's a very powerful color, very powerful green. This is the deep sap green here. And it's just the filter a little closer. All right. Kyanite. So kyanite is this mineral. Uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier. And um, this color is very unique. Um, it comes out of the tube as almost being like a Payne's gray. Uh, but when you brush it out, um, it actually has a little surprise to it. You get a, um, you get a lot of shimmer out of this color. A lot of the um, uh, mica that's associated with the, with the mineral actually gets transferred uh, to, gets transferred to, uh, to the watercolor, which is really fun because you can create some different effects, especially if you're trying to um, uh, create something that's going to catch somebody's eye. And it is, it is a gorgeous granulating deep blue. And then when this starts to set up, and I'll show you a little bit later when it, when it sets up, but you'll start to see a lot of shimmer associated with this. All right, so here's the color that actually made me fall in love with Daniel Smith. And um, when I was uh, younger, uh, when I first got into watercolor, um, I, uh, my first big investment was a $5.99 set of uh, Prang watercolor. And I thought that was actually pretty good for a while. Up until uh, I had one of these friends that said, you, you need to try this. And he said, here, I need you to try the Daniel Smith Mayan Blue. And, um, and I went ahead and tried it and suddenly my mind was blown. So suddenly my praying watercolor just wasn't doing it for me anymore. Cause I kept on wondering why doesn't my other colors look like this? <laughs> so, but uh, Mayan blue is, is, uh, is, is the color that really made me fall in love with Daniel Smith about 20 years ago. And um, it's my, pretty much my, my go-to blue, if I'm gonna use a blue in, in my work. And um, 
it is just a, a gorgeous, gorgeous, um, deep, lush blue. There it is right here. Right there. And the other fun thing too, that I really like um, is how blendable uh, Mayan blue is. Um, you can take a little bit of um, Quinn Gold once again. You can take a little bit of Quinn Gold and it creates um, some, some just gorgeous color. It's right up there. So, and it's really interesting the way Mayan blue is actually made. What the, uh, the way that the Mayans would actually make the, uh, make the color or the pigment is that they would take clay and then they would mix it or infuse it with indigo. And then that's how they made Mayan blue. Um, uh, there's also uh, different variants of, of, the, of the Mayan color uh, uh, manufacturing process where we have, a, we have a Mayan orange, we have a Mayan yellow. Um, but um, the reason why um, um, Mayan blue exists in the Primatic collection is because we use uh, real indigo uh, when, when they make this color. All right, uh, Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. All right. Sleeping Beauty is this really warm and granulating blue. It, um, it's, it's a lot of fun to work with. And it is just a kind of a gorgeous aqua. All right, so I'm going to switch over to the um, to their basically the general side of our color chart, and I have a selection of colors there. It's a little bit, it'll be a little bit different than the dot cards that you all have. Um, I'm just I pulled the ones out that I thought were were interesting, um, that are different. And the first one I'm going to show is Aussie red gold. And it's very similar to, to Quinn Gold, except that it's, it's definitely a little bit brighter. Um, it's definitely uh, one of the colors um, um, that's really wonderful to blend with because you can get a lot of different, uh, different hues out of this depending upon the color in which you blend with. So it's a, it's a great, uh, great blending color. Now this next color is called Bordeaux. And Bordeaux is a, is a very powerful, very powerful um, red. It, um, it has a lot of reactivity, I call it. Um, meaning that uh, this color wants to just take, wants to just take over. And uh, one of the fun little things that you can do with it that I, that I think is a lot of fun is that you go ahead and you create a, a little spot and make it about the size of a, a, of a silver dollar. And then you go ahead and you pick up a, a, little, a little chunk of that and then you just drop it in the water and then you get all of these beautiful blooms. But it is a, a very strong and, and dominant color. Um, really does interesting things with, um, with actually with Payne's Gray. Um, you can get a lot of uh, different um, 
different tonality when you get those two colors together. It creates some just beautiful hues. All right, this is Cascade Green. So Cascade Green um, is, is a color I, re I really uh, tend to use quite a bit. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons why I, I kind of gravitate to it because it reminds me of, uh, of a place that my parents used to take me when I was young um, by Crater Lake in, in Oregon. And I remember um, looking up into the trees and, and seeing this color. So some of, some of my colors I, I actually have nicknames for. So this color is actually uh, Northwest in a tube and it creates these beautiful greens and blues um, that I'm used to seeing in the trees in Oregon. All right, let's look at a yellow. So here's a cool yellow. This is lemon yellow. So it's just a very cool semi-opaque yellow. All right, by comparison, here is New Gamboge. Uh, so with Lemon Yellow, you had your cool yellow and with New Gamboge, we are gonna look at more of a warm tone. And actually I get quite a, quite a few compliments about our new gamboge. Um, I know um, uh, for some that this color uh, isn't necessarily all that exciting, but with, uh, with ours, I find, I find that we, because it has a, lot, uh, has a lot of warmth associated with it um, and a little bit more vibrancy than I think people are, are, are used to seeing that, that it's, uh, it catches a lot of people by surprise. All right, next color is Moon Glow. And Moon Glow is a very interesting color and it has an uh, uh, interesting background. It, it, was, uh, it was what we call an oops color. We didn't intend to make it. So the chemist had a long weekend. We don't know exactly what from, um, but he uh, got a little happy with, with one of the pigments. and. Um, while it didn't uh, turn out exactly the way that he wanted, it still produced a, a very beautiful color. So we ended up calling it Moon Glow. So, and what's interesting, you know, the other question I get asked a lot is, well, how do you name these colors? So we already identified uh, one way we do it. We, we name it after the mine that it comes from. Uh, and we'll take a look at a couple different things. We'll look at, you know, how many pigments did it, did it take to make the color? So if it's a single pigment, we'll generally stick with the historical name. With, um, if it's made from two pigments, usually the same, we'll, we'll stick with the historical name. But by the time we get to, uh, if a color is made with three pigments, we can pretty much call it what we want. So this is Moon Glow. So moon glow is very interesting because it, it'll actually start to kind of shift before your eyes and change a little bit. And what you'll see is that um, one of the pigments that the chemist got a little happy with starts to present itself. And what you'll start to see is on the edge, you'll start to see this, this reddish, uh, um, this reddish uh, tone along the edge of your paper. And that is one of the pigments um, used and it wants to be a little bit more dominant than the other two. So, and, and as this starts to set up, you'll start to see that effect starting to happen.
All right, this is Payne's Blue Gray. This is a newer color for us that came out in 2017. And uh, this color um, is very, very, I think it's very interesting. It has um, some very deep blue, but then you, all start, you also start to see all of this um, uh, sort of uh, gray, uh, this gray start to push through and it creates a really different effect. It's very, very strong. And, it's, and it granulates just beautifully. All right, let's look at Prussian blue. So Prussian blue kind of takes you to the other end of the scale in terms of blue. With Prussian blue, you're gonna get some warmer, more brighter, more um, vibrant tones. And it's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous color that, that um, does like to blend well with others actually. It's almost like, almost like an electric blue, the way that it wants to jump. All right. All right, this will be the last one. And I get a lot of requests. Well, what do you, what about, uh, I like to do flowers. What colors do you recommend for, uh, uh, for doing flowers and florals and things like that? And, and this is the one that I probably suggest the most. And it is a uh, transparent pyrrole orange. And it is a, uh, it, it's a powerhouse in terms of um, color strength and permanency. But what I really like is that um, it really creates a, a really nice cross between an alizarin crimson and, and, and a scarlet. Let's see if we can get this brush clean. And depending upon how much you have in your brush or how much water, you can really soften that down and, and get, a, get some really, really pretty different tones. All right. Does anybody have any questions? We are, we've uh, kind of hit our two hours and um, just want to make sure that I give everybody an opportunity to ask a question if they have one. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Wendy again. Wendy, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, be in front of your folks. I appreciate it. Um, and um, just wanted to also thank uh, um, uh, Eric and his uh, team at Plaza Art for for uh, being uh, being able to do this all with you also. Um, one of the things that I want to uh, just remind you all, um, um, please support uh, your local art, your local art store like Plaza. It's very important uh, in this day and age um, uh, with everything that we have going on with, um, you know, with Amazon and, and some of the other things, please, please remember to support these guys. Um, you know, the pandemic has, has been, uh, been tough on everybody and, and I'm sure, um, I'm sure Plaza would, would really appreciate your support. Um, uh, Wendy, is there uh, anything that you would, you would like to chime in about? <laughs> You're still muted. Still <laughs> there muted. you are. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you, Scott and Eric and the entire plaza staff that made this happen. Um, as I was talking to many of our members, I said, this is 
goes before learning techniques of other artists. You're learning about your materials mm -hmm. and really you get started and we don't want you to stop, mm -hmm. you know, because looking at what these paints do and hearing why they do it. So thank you very much. Applause. Thank you. This thank was you. wonderful. And you think, wow, two hours just isn't enough to go through it all. It really isn't. You know, it's, it's, um, um, one time I was doing this and I wasn't really paying attention to the clock. And then all of a sudden somebody said, well, I have to leave now. It's time for dinner. And I looked up at the clock and I ran over by an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why that happens. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's just so much fun. It's so much fun to be able to talk with artists about materials and, and fun things like that. I mean, there were so many different other areas that we could have went down. We could have talked about paper for a while. We could have... Yeah. Uh, we could have talked uh, talked a lot about that, but you know what? I'm going to save that for when I can actually be in front of you all again, uh, oh, yeah. in person. So I'm hoping um, I, I I am I am hoping beyond hoping that you know next year that we'll have the uh, Plaza Hands On Creativity event again, and mm -hmm. and I can come hang out with you all, and and we can talk about our love of of paint and paper and brushes and all that sort of thing. Oh. That would be wonderful. We look forward to those days. We miss our socials mm -hmm. and our hands Absolutely. On. Absolutely. Yeah, we well, um, I just want to wish you all a, a very merry, happy, uh, happy holiday season. Um, please, uh, please stay well and safe. And, and uh, I can't wait to see you all in person again soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Email me if you have any other questions, guys. Thank you, Scott. Merry Christmas.